Hello and welcome to Perspectives, the weekly edition. I'm Sebastian Gomes, your guest host for this very special episode for the Week of Prayer for Christian Unity. Unity among the Christian churches. Maybe it seems impossible considering our long-standing historical divisions. But since 1908, Christians have been coming together for one week each year to pray and reflect on Scripture together, to participate in ecumenical services, and to share fellowship. This week of prayer has been the lifeblood of the ecumenical movement over the past century. Today, all the Christian churches express, in one way or another, the fact that division is a scandal and contradicts the will of Christ. So, praying together and, where possible, giving a common witness is a Christian obligation. That's more important than ever today as we face enormous global challenges, the widespread persecution of Christians, the ecological crisis, realities that impel the churches to a deeper reflection on the importance of unity today. So to help us understand where we are and where we're headed, I'm joined by two local ecumenical experts. Father Damien McPherson is the Director for Ecumenical and Interfaith Affairs for the Archdiocese of Toronto. He's also a Franciscan friar of the Atonement, the religious order that established the Week of Prayer for Christian Unity way back in 1908. And Bishop Lyndon Nichols is a suffragan bishop of the Anglican Diocese of Toronto for the area of Trent, Durham. She's co-chair of the Anglican Roman Catholic Dialogue in Canada and since 2011 has been a member of the Anglican Roman Catholic International Commission. Thank you both for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Father Damien, let's start with you. I mean, we're, we're here, at, we have the Week of Prayer for Christian Unity again this year. Uh, when you look at the church as a whole, what's the mood? What's the ecumenical spirit at this moment at the beginning of 2016? Well, let's say that challenge would mark the, uh, the degree to which we are uh, on this journey together. Uh, you know, I think what keeps us going is this deep yearning of hope and that we are simply unable to abandon that. And perhaps uh, it, we're called uh, more keenly to be aware of that by the presence of Pope Francis, who really has been an instrument of unity in ways that we have never anticipated um, and in ways in which he just simply seems to do naturally. Nice. And I'm often in, in the context of uh, my co-workers in uh, Christian, different Christian communities and th they're constantly giving adulation and praise to Francis. Uh, you know, it makes my work very easy in some ways because he's really established for himself a legitimate uh, ministry that expresses this heartfelt desire for the unity of the church. I want to talk a little bit more about uh, about Francis later on, and specifically some of the things that he's doing that that are so appealing, not only to Catholics but so many of our Christian brothers and sisters. Uh, Bishop Linda, the mood right now in the Anglican Communion about the ecumenical movement and where we are today. What's it like? Well, certainly at the international level, there's a deep desire to continue to be in conversation and dialogue with ecumenical partners. I think at the heart of it is that passage in John 17, that they may be one. Jesus' prayer for the disciples is the prayer for the church. The challenge at the local and the, the regional levels is the on-the-ground challenges that people are facing uh, within their churches, within the denominations. Um, we live in a time when, when things are shifting around how church will be expressed and that's causing some, some significant challenges. And so the ecumenical uh, conversation sometimes is hard to hear at the local level. Uh, when people are more concerned about their own life and survival. Uh, but I also hear moments of great joy as people do share together and um, exchange opportunities to serve together. So yeah. it is happening. Yeah. yeah. Now, there are many challenges, obviously, but we've all come a long way, especially in the last 50 years. I know mm -hmm. in the Catholic Church we can, we can mark the Second Vatican Council of the 1960s as a, as a big sort of watershed moment for the Catholic Church. Uh, bringing it into the ecumenical movement and really uh, uh, becoming a protagonist in that movement. But in, in the Anglican community, the history of the Anglican community, maybe even in the last 50 years, have there been 
any of those breakthrough moments, those things that we can point to, we can say, yeah, we took a huge leap forward? Yeah. Probably one of the most significant is uh, the uh, uh, full communion agreements between Anglicans and Lutherans, particularly in Canada and in the United States, where we have been moving closer and closer together and now often share um, ministries where we have Anglicans and Lutherans worshiping together with a minister who may come from either one of the traditions and or where they're sharing um, space together. Uh, sharing life and ministry together, particularly across Western Canada, but also right here in Ontario. That took some significant work and discussion and listening to one another. Uh, and you see it expressed most joyfully in the relationship between our primate and the presiding bishop of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Canada, between Fred Hiltz and Susan Johnson. And they often make um, joint statements on many, many issues as a way of witnessing to our coming together. So that's been one of the most significant that I've seen. Well, Damien, I mentioned the Second Vatican Council. What was it about that moment, that experience, uh, that changed the whole Catholic outlook on ecumenism? For those of us who lived back then, uh, we, we saw the church singularly as ours, and everybody else outside of it somehow were, uh, were uh, distant and uh, not a part of. Uh, the Second Vatican Council, through nothing other than the singular inspiration of the Holy Spirit, allowed those church fathers to recognize the need to be globally aware of our partners in Christ, in Jesus. And in, in so doing, to open the doors to dialogue, to engage our, ourselves uh, with one another, to to mine the treasures, you might say, that other traditions and communions have so that together we can be a, a stronger witness to the, the gospel values which Jesus preaches and teaches and, and indeed, as Bishop said, to, to be an ambassador uh, for uh, the fulfillment of the prayer that Jesus yearned for, that they all may be one, Father, as you are in me and I am in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you have sent me. That's the driving force that we must constantly uh, go back to and draw energy from in order to move forward. What was the reaction, I mean, as a historical event, what was the action, a reaction of, of, of Anglicans and other Christians to that very important moment uh, in the 1960s, the Second Vatican Council? I think people were amazed at what was happening in the Second Vatican Council. Uh, um, probably the most visible uh, change was moving the liturgy into the into the language of the people um, uh, but something but also that had been that, done in the in the in the Protestant churches for yes, centuries for centuries yeah, yeah. yeah. and uh, but but then also that move that opened the door to the to the possibility of recognition of one another as church and um, and the the joy particularly in the Anglican communion of people who'd been working for some kind of dialogue since the early part of the 20th century and being able to see that move forward in, in the late 60s with a formal dialogue being established in the Anglican Roman Catholic International Commission, which we fondly call ARCIC. And the work that it's done over the last 40 years um, has been really remarkable in, in defining ways in which we are so much um, the same or similar, and that we recognize uh, our baptisms, we recognize, uh, we've learned to understand our, our definition of the Eucharist in new ways. And even, although some Anglicans would have some difficulty with it, but I think there's been many who've been able to see the papacy, or at least the idea of a universal primate in a new light because of that dialogue. And uh, it's, it's still a, you know, an issue that we're having to listen to and wrestle with, um, but I think it opened a door that had not been opened until that. And, and you know, I think, yeah. I don't mean to interrupt you, but I, I think one of the ecumenical nuggets that, that's in the documents of the Second Vatican Council as it relates to the Anglican Communion is the degree to which the Roman Catholic Church affirms, and the word it uses is its esteemed uh, respect for the Anglican Communion. And, and I, I like to refresh my memory and other people's memory of that, uh, especially when uh, your dialogue partner is struggling, is, is, is in th that it's at that point that we should be the strongest in terms of our relationship with one another. We should allow our strengths to be present 
uh, and, and we should allow the other to receive them as best as possible without ownership, but some kind of leadership in that regard. We're going to take a quick break, but we'll be right back with much more. We're going to look specifically at some of the issues facing the Catholic and Anglican uh, dialogue, as well as some areas where we can witness commonly. So don't go anywhere. We'll be back right after this. Tante controversie tra cristiani ereditati dal passato si possono superare mettendo da parte ogni atteggiamento polemico o apologetico e cercando insieme di cogliere in profondità ciò che ci unisce e cioè la chiamata a partecipare al mistero dell'amore del Padre rivelato a noi dal Figlio per mezzo dello Spirito Santo. L'unità dei cristiani, siamo convinti, non sarà il frutto di raffinate discussioni teoriche nelle quali ciascuno tenterà di convincere l'altro della fondatezza delle proprie opinioni. Verrà il Figlio dell'uomo e ci troverà ancora nelle discussioni. Dobbiamo riconoscere che per giungere alla profondità del mistero di Dio abbiamo bisogno gli uni degli altri, di incontrarci e di confrontarci sotto la guida dello Spirito Santo che armonizza le diversità e supera il conflitto riconcilia le diversità. Welcome back. We're talking about ecumenism during this week of prayer for Christian unity. I'm joined by Bishop Linda Nichols of the Anglican Communion and Father Damian McPherson, uh, works for the Archdiocese here in ecumenical and interfaith work. Now, the week of prayer itself. This year uh, we have a theme from uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, called to proclaim the mighty acts of God. Uh, this year's theme and, and the reflections that will be celebrated at local churches throughout the world um, uh, prepared by an ecumenical group in Latvia. And one of the, th one of the key things that they've been focusing on in, in their reflections, and any of these, these are available to people on the internet if, uh, if they want to participate, the key thing uh, for the, in their reflection is, what does it mean to be the people of God? And this is a very important question in the church. It was something, again, we mentioned the Second Vatican Council that came up at the Second Vatican Council. The church articulated itself as the people of God. But in 2016, considering what's happening in the world, and we're going to get in, into some of those issues, what does it mean to be the people of God? Bishop Linda, may we'll start with you. For Anglicans, over the last number of years, we've been focusing on our baptismal covenant. And the questions in that covenant, besides the declaration of the Apostles' Creed uh, about the, the basic beliefs we have about God and Christ and the Spirit, are about how do we live that out? And we live it out in community. We live it out through participation in worship and study of the scriptures. We live it out in confession, in personal confession and corporate confession. We live it out in loving our neighbor as ourselves. And we live it out in seeking justice and dignity for all human beings. And we live it out in caring for God's creation. And so those are part of the questions that we're called to live out. And so we invite people to think about what does it mean to live those out in the world? through our understanding of God, through our following Jesus Christ and listening to the guidance of the Spirit. And it's, um, it's a challenge because we're constantly facing new things happening around us, whether it's the refugee crisis, whether it's the oil crisis, whether it's uh, you know, climate change, whatever it is, we're having to ask, what is God calling us to do and be in this moment? Here in Toronto, the ecumenical service uh, that will take place at the end of the week of prayer for Christian unity is at the Chaldean Church, but there's going to be a major focus on, on refugees. We were talking about this just before the show. Uh, why is that important, to bring an ecumenical prayer service together with something that 
that we're facing as a society in this refugee challenge uh, here in Canada? Well, I mean, I, you know, ecumenism is not simply theology. It's not simply the speculative ideas that we deal with in terms of theological dialogue. The, the reality of the ecumenical world is at the grassroots level where people live and have their being and where they suffer, where they rejoice, where they celebrate. And so how, how unfortunate it would be if we gather as a Christian community and not be aware of the pain and suffering that's around us and to draw that into the prayer life of the ecumenical world, you know. And so it was important, I thought, that we, that we do that by acknowledging uh, the, the presence of the uh, refugees that are here in Canada, who, by the way, will be at the service uh, on, in January. Yeah, often, often people view ecumenical work as the, the dialogue between theologians and historians, trying to work out how did we end up here and what do we need to sort out in terms of our doctrines, our theology. But, uh, but for people in the pews, the reality is, how do I live with my neighbor who is Muslim or Jewish or Hindu or Sikh or, or Buddhist? Um, how, do I, how do I understand and live with that in, in this current time? And it's about living for the common good, which is something that, that we talk about a lot as Christians. That we're not only here for the Christian community, we're here for the whole world and the common good. And so what does it mean to um, care about the common good for my Muslim neighbor, for the refugee around the, from, across the, from across the world? Um, what does it mean to, to work at that together? And that's why it's important to keep it rooted in actual practice and action. And that can have a powerful impact on the society as well. I mean, I'm thinking of you know, Catholics and Anglicans and, and people, people from other Christian traditions uh, uniting their voices to speak on behalf of the common good, that can have a powerful impact, can it not? It does. I mean, we've had times when, when our archbishops and other faith leaders and Christian leaders have come together and signed statements such as the letter that was in the Toronto Star a couple of years ago on poverty. Um, just a, an incredible crisis that in this country of wealth that we still have people who, who can barely survive. Uh, in the midst of our communities. So um, our leaders speaking out to our government on homelessness and poverty issues are powerful. Let's look at another uh, issue that is affecting the entire world, and that's the issue of persecution. I mean, a 2015 uh, Pew Research report uh, uh, found that Christians face, quoting here, more persecution than any other religious group uh, worldwide. This is obviously a huge concern for all of the Christian churches. What, what does the impact of what's happening now regarding Christian persecution do for ecumenical discussions or how does it influence how we look at ecumenism today? Bishop. I'd have to say I'm not sure that Canadians are particularly aware of that persecution of Christians. They hear little snippets in the news, but depending on how the news is reported, it may not be reported that the persecution was because of their faith. And so uh, awareness, I think, is going to be one of the key issues uh, for Canadians, is are we aware of the degree to which that's happening? Um, unfortunately, I think sometimes that if people are really aware, then it becomes a reason for hate and revenge that builds up and leads to other incidents that are not helpful. Um, and so we're in a, a difficult time where those kind of dialogues as in ecumenical dialogue and in interfaith dialogue are even more important that uh, to understand what are the roots of that persecution and is that per persecution based on, on theological grounds or is it really political and economic grounds that are driving it. And I think that kind of understanding and analysis is going to be essential um, as, alongside of the awareness to be sure that that educational piece is there as well. If I could just add, uh, Pope Francis again uh, has coined the term ecumenism of, of blood, mm -hmm. which you know has a has a real uh, uh, wellspring of, of of knowledge inside of it. You might say it, it simply dissolves all the structures that divide us mm -hmm. when we talk about ecumenism of the blood. You know. Doesn't matter whether you're Lutheran or Anglican or Catholic or what have you. You died for Jesus, and that's the salvific uh, 
message that the gospel calls all of us to. And so I, I, I like that term, and we need to be constantly aware of it because, you know, it's the faith of the martyrs that are the seed of the church. And so as it continues in a manner that's much different than it was in its original days, it's happening still today. And so uh, while it's tragic and it's difficult, uh, Pope Francis has been able to kind of recognize the value of it as an ecumenical event. Bishop, I wanted to ask you specifically about uh, uh, an initiative that you've been involved with as the co-chair of the Anglican Roman Catholic Dialogue here in Canada, and that's this series, Did You Ever Wonder, mm -hmm. uh, which is an interesting series. Uh, give us a little background on that, and then we're going to show a little clip and show people how they can get some more information on that. Uh, the Anglican Roman Catholic Dialogue um, asked, is there a, a project we could do together to address some of the common questions that people have about faith, um, particularly young adults who are questioning, so why even believe? Why the church? Why pray? What about science and faith? And how do we look at these? And so the dialogue decided that each member of the dialogue would take a topic and write a short essay on that topic that could be a stimulus for conversation and put with it a few questions. And uh, we were deeply grateful to Salt and Light for being willing to videotape each of the members um, uh, reading their paper so that it can be shown in a group. Uh, and the, uh, we really enjoyed the opportunity because we read the papers to each other. Um, they're not an official statement of either church. They're the, they're the responsibility of the author. But they were done together and critiqued together and uh, shared together. And I'd have to say it was lots of fun. <laughs> So I hope people will enjoy them and engage in them together. Maybe Roman Catholic and Anglican shared parishes or an ecumenical um, dialogue group uh, or a Lenten. Uh, we've heard of one church in, in the prairies that's going to use it as their Lenten study and uh, do that in a joint manner. So I hope that it will be a good resource for the churches. We have a clip here of uh, Bishop uh, Donald Boland, who's yes, from Saskatoon, yeah, but yeah. with you, the co-chair yes, yeah. of the yeah. Anglican Roman Catholic Dialogue. Yeah. Uh, let's take a look at uh, his contribution to that series. Jesus gathered his disciples into a community, and there is a belonging that flows naturally from the profession of faith in him. It's not a perfect community, not a community without deep divisions, but it is nonetheless a community bound together by an abiding hope, by a common trust in God's work in our midst, by a desire to live deeply the way of life open for us by Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. When divided Christians together profess in the Apostles or Nicene Creed that we believe, we come to know and experience what we already know in theory, that despite our wounds, we are part of one body of believers, one body in Christ, called evermore to live as one body. Already now we are bound together in a real communion, even if that communion is, is not yet complete. We were made to be a part of something larger than ourselves, and we believe and belong by grace of the God who eternally desires that we find abundant life in Him. Did You Ever Wonder is a common witness project of the Anglican Roman Catholic Dialogue of Canada. You can find more video reflections at didyouEverWonder.ca. Welcome back to our conversation on ecumenism during the week of prayer for Christian unity here with Bishop Linda Nichols and Father Damien McPherson. Uh, the conversation is very interesting so far. We've been looking at some of the common uh, witness projects, initiatives, and challenges that the world is facing that uh, we're, we're, we can sort of come together on. One of those is certainly the ecological crisis. Father Damien, you mentioned the influence of Pope Francis on the ecumenical conversation. Uh, and certainly the publication of his encyclical Laudato Si was another contribution to that and something that a lot of people are using as a reference point for how to deal with the ecological crisis. How do you see the impact of that and this common concern of, of the ecological crisis uh, having on the ecumenical discussion? Well, you know, one of the things about Francis's encyclical is nobody has to be convinced about the truth of it. It's just there and it's just real and it's just explosive when you come to terms with it um, and, and it's it has a natural character to be ecumenical to be interfaith uh, it weaves us together as a people who are 
um, who, who have to pay attention to something that's very serious. Anybody today, I think it's fair to say, who doesn't recognize the importance of the ecology and the ecological situation we're in is either stubborn, ignorant, or blind. Uh, take your choice. It's not a choice we arbitrarily make as much as it is a responsibility we must necessarily assume. And, and, and it's handmade to be ecumenical and, and interfaith, you know. Um, the degree to which we, and, and you know, the other thing is, is it's a great partnership with the, um, uh, the uh, patriarch uh, of Constantinople because he himself is a leader and, and had written and spoken long before the Roman Catholic Church stepped into the, the center, you might say, of the discussion. An interesting point there, too, I, I was going to mention, I, I remember last August uh, 2015, uh, that Pope Francis really pushed the Catholic Church to participate in that day of prayer for creation, which has been an Orthodox practice, I think, since 1989. Uh, and after Pope Francis sort of awoke the Catholic Church to that reality, many of the other Christian churches said, we'll get on board with that too, and it's become a really uh, real center, a real uh, meeting place. Uh, but your thoughts, Bishop Linda, on, on the ecological crisis and, and where we need to go? Well, it, it as, as Father Damien has said, it's the, it's the ready-made common issue that we all share. Our very life depends on our response to this. And we share, as God's people, the common uh, creation and, and the common responsibility uh, for being stewards of creation. And, and so the work of doing that together is just a natural and it's growing. It's still not fully engaged by many congregations, but I think it's growing as congregations look at themselves, as they look at their neighbors, as they ask how can we be more involved. And so it is a place for common witness and common voice in advocacy, particularly with our governments, uh, local as well as, uh, as, well as national. Mm -hmm. You know, although he's a Jesuit, he's got a Franciscan heart. <laughs> <laughs> and a Franciscan name. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> name. Yeah. Very good. Okay, let's, let's get some closing thoughts. Uh, I mean, as you said right off the top, Father Damien, ecumenical work is, is, is a work of hope. It's, we, have, we have to live in hope the entire time. And uh, it's a challenging thing, it's a difficult thing, and it's not a fast-moving thing. Things don't change very quickly, immediately. So uh, when you look at the ecumenical movement today, what's happening, the realities that we're facing, uh, what are signs of hope, and where do you think we're headed? Well, there may be a risk involved here, but let me take it. Like, uh, are we halfway there? Um, I'd like to hope that we are at least halfway there. You know what I mean? Uh, but we really need to have, uh, you know, energy for the future. And so, like, uh, carrying on with enthusiasm and, and keeping the flame alive is really critical to the, to the ecumenical hope that, that must drive us, really. Um, and so, while it's, while it's painstakingly slow, I think uh, the reality is that there are signs of hope that encourage us to continue. And so we need to take those with God's grace and with our partnerships. People sometimes ask me, um, why are you so engaged in Anglican Roman Catholic dialogue when the possibility of some form of coming together seems so distant and we keep finding new stumbling blocks? And I would say it, it is a long-term process. It's going to be painstakingly slow. Uh, but what gives me hope are the relationships that I have with Roman Catholic colleagues and friends, people who become friends because of our dialogue. And I see that happening at the local level, and I think that's where the hope is. It's ultimately going to be in people building relationships that make a difference in their community and in the world, and they say, this is worth doing, and we need to keep doing it. Bishop Linda, Father Damien, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. That's all for this episode of Perspectives, the weekly edition. But be sure to connect with us on Facebook and Twitter. We'll see you again next time. I'm Sebastian Gomes.